Hi, everybody. My name is Melissa Ojeda. I'm the founder and creative consultant at Miami Reps. Miami Reps is a branding and marketing consulting company, and here we represent mural artists, photographers, videographers, illustrators, and animators. Today is April 1st, and I promise we are not fooling anyone today. <laughs> we actually have Miami Reps member, James Jackman. He's a commercial and editorial photographer based in Miami, Florida. His work is unlike anything that I have seen recently. He actually has a very unique style. It's a reportage documentary like style brand narratives. And that was something that I really, really loved about his work. So James, here you are today, and I'd love you to take it away and introduce yourself. Hey, everyone. Um, I'm James Jackman. Uh, I'm based in Boca Raton, Florida, about 40 miles north of Miami, but most of my work's out of Miami. Um, I studied photography at Savannah College of Art and Design uh, in Savannah, Georgia. I uh, graduated in 2011 and um, been traveling and photographing and uh loving on plants ever since then um most of my work revolves around documenting our relationship with plants um and i really love working with companies that uh, appreciate that idea as well and i know one of the things that you mentioned is that you traveled um one of the things that i did read was that you know once you were in college you really discovered your love for photography and then you started traveling yeah and influenced your style do you feel like that had an influence in the way that you photograph with that documentary style like definitely yeah yeah um yeah at scad uh the photo department sort of had two tracks of study um one was commercial and one was fine art um i stayed on the fine art side but um you know obviously to make a living wanting to monetize that and spend my time documenting and making art. Um, so that's that's kind of, uh, I think that's why like what you're saying about um, this documentary style brand narrative being what I do is because I, I really do care about the craft. Um, I think it's really important uh, telling stories and being able to convey them through images. Um, so yeah, that and, uh, SCAD opened a campus in Hong Kong in 2010. Um, and myself and a few other photographers that I was studying with, we were selected to go attend that campus and work on a book project. Um, the campus was located in a neighborhood called Shem Shui Po. Um, and so we started working on a book uh, and all were given assignments to photograph different parts of Shem Shui Po. Um, my assignment was this sort of loose documentary uh kind of go out on the street and see what's going on today photograph it and turn it in kind of work um and that definitely uh changed my interest in photography from purely fine art to um documenting to you know being inspired by photojournalism um so yeah that you know going to SCAD definitely had a big impact on what I'm doing today. And do you feel like with your travels and wanting to tell stories, was there a moment where you kind of shifted your work into more from the reportage to the brand narrative aspect of your work? Uh, not necessarily a moment, but I think more so seeing, seeing good photographic work being used commercially um, kind of, you know, that that caught my attention and I started thinking, hey, you know, I, I you know, there's definitely value in this for companies and, um, you know, I'd like to work to align myself with those companies that I think are, um, you know, doing right in the world, so to speak, um, honoring the environment that we live in. Um, so, so yeah, that, that kind of became a mission to develop that personal style and develop something that is commercially viable but also kind of honest to how i feel about man's relationship with nature and i know that your portfolio consists of 
you know, documentary, documentary style brand narratives that are focusing on stories that embrace nature as a resource. Um, describe your, bo your body of work in three words. Um, yeah, I, I, I brainstormed this last night. Um, uh, so natural, curious, and green. Um, and green being an idea as well as a color because I, I definitely tend to stay on a, a green color palette, um, just kind of happens. Um, but yeah, I, I, this, this word natural is a funny word because everything in the world is natural. Computers are natural because humans made them and humans are natural. Um, so yeah, I, I, think, I think those are three that kind of nail it in my head. I don't know how you feel. Yeah, I think so too. I feel like green does really stand out both on the sustainable aspect. I know that you really yeah. focus on brands that work with renewable energy or even agriculture is a really big theme in your work. Exactly. Yeah. Well. And even the color palette, it being green and you know, you being from South Florida. I can't help it. It's what I'm photographing. Right. It's just there. It's like a jungle everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> And there, and there really is a nostalgic feeling in your work as well. And especially for me also being from South Florida, seeing the green, seeing the familiar people. I mean, one of my favorite projects from you, which I know is an ongoing series is Conchetta. Yeah. And I always feel like in Miami, everyone knows a Conchetta, you know, like they're yeah, definitely. Right. And um, there definitely was one in my life. And so cool. I feel like I relate to your work in so many ways. And it's just nice to be able to find another photographer who also has a passionate about their environment and photographing the people in it, because the people are very much as the environment as nature is. As well. Yeah. Yeah. I, I spent a lot of time with Conchetta. So I'm she's kind of a, a role model for me um someone that is living in a way that i admire um and you know it's it's a totally beautiful lifestyle and place that she sort of curated around her so you know i i go all the time and just see what she's up to and you know she's either making pasta or you know pickled cabbage or making soap or you know hanging clothes to dry outside and so i try you know try to photograph all that and in a meaningful way and uh and share that with people and they seem people seem to really love that i you know what what you said that's that's really special um other people that don't have conchettas they wish they had conchettas in their life so yeah i i really like that i, I really do see a lightness in that series and mm. you can kind of hear the sounds of wind chimes which i feel like you always hear yeah there's some wind chimes there for sure <laughs> Right, like it is yeah. in the back, uh, backyard and yeah. the smell of her mangoes and even just her cooking. It's, it feels very relatable to anyone who lives down in Miami and being able mm. to see that series of work really is so lovely. And um, it's actually one of my favorite projects of yours because- Oh, it, thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I know that when you photograph, you're able to really capture the feeling of the viewer exploring an environment with you, whether you're in Maui photographing the Palm Jungle at the Marin Conservancy, or yeah. you're shooting for the ongoing series with Conchetta as well, exploring her backyard and picking the fruit with her. And was there a specific memory or moment in your life that inspired the work that you create today um you know it's 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 hard to say exactly you know where artistic and inspiration comes from i mean there's definitely other photographers you know that i could pull up that inspire me um but you know everyone has their own unique way of working um i definitely you know i mentioned studying in hong kong and, and walking around and photographing there um and you know, to be completely awestruck by a city, you know, like the first time traveling abroad, pretty much, um, to show up in a place like Hong Kong, uh, that's so incredibly chaotic, um, to, to make sense of it, I think, you know, or, or to, to convey it to people, you really do have to focus on those details, on those things that, you know, you walk around and you're on some quiet street and you say, oh, wow, look at, you know, this guy's, 
working on carving a casket, you know. Um, Hong Kong is unique in that, that the trades are very much out on the street to view. Um, so I, I, I think that that time studying there definitely developed the idea of um, focusing on these small details that make up uh, a whole, you know. Um, and I tend to be quiet when I photograph, uh, especially like working with Conchetta and stuff like that. I kind of just watch and see what she's doing. Um, and there's, you know, maybe little movements or ways that something is being held um, that interests me. And I think it's, it is almost voyeuristic in a sense, you know, if, you, if you've ever kind of um, watched someone do something in public and you think, wow, that's funny the way they're doing that, or that's kind of cute how they're doing that. Um, uh, I, there's a, a photo I took in Havana of um, two people just holding hands, like standing at the edge of a street, like waiting to cross. Um, and, and that is, you know, that, that touches me seeing people being gentle with each other. Um, and so I like to capture those small moments like that, um, rather than focus on, although I do photograph, you know, a, a landscape or a cityscape or something like that. I, I think, I really think it is those small things, those details that, um, are interesting. Yeah, you really do capture a lot of the detail and you just have so much attention to detail what's going on around you. I mean, I really feel like your work plays around with all five senses. I mean, I really feel mm -hmm. like when I'm looking at your work, I can hear the trees moving in the wind or even mm -hmm. the bugs or the birds that would be in that specific space, especially. Yeah the Merwin Conservancy project, being able to explore within the space. And you even have details of the spines of the palm, the berries that you might find, and even the tools that you might use when you're cutting them down or trimming them. That is something that I think is so great that you do in your work and that you're, you're, nice. you're really able to find that push and pull in a lot of your work that I feel like sometimes is missing in storytelling is mm. you're able to really show the entire environment, but then also show the close-ups and the details yeah. that we might be missing or might not even see as yeah. a photographer. And that's something that I really love in your work is your ability oh, to do that. And we know as photographers, our work comes from a place of inspiration and oftentimes experience. Mm -hmm. I know that you're a gardener and yeah. as a gardener, did you feel that your connection to nature had an impact on the way that you photographed? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, several years ago, uh, my brother and I were living in my grandfather's old house and it's a standard Florida house with a lawn all around it. Um, and we just started planting fruit trees um, and letting the grass grow tall, um, letting all the bushes grow into their natural form after being, you know, kept rectangular for all their lives. Um, and we did that because we were interested in this idea of uh, making a food forest, um, which is like essentially letting nature do what it wants to do, but, but adding the right plants to let it do it with. Um, but it, it definitely, for me, was uh, like, like a muse almost, um, or like a sculpture, you know, like a time-based type piece of art. Um, you, know, you photograph the process of it, and after so many years, you can sit and look back at the photographs and go, oh my god, that was grass before, and here's the after, and it's so striking. Um, so that, that definitely, you know, that, that was my first time um really intensely working with plants and gardening um i don't i don't want anyone to think that like i plant plants in a row and they all come out like perfect vegetables i more so work with um perennials and and down here that's banana trees and yucca and mango trees and, and I, I like a lot of um those bigger things uh, stuff you don't normally find in the grocery store pretty much um, but yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm, you know, working with plants, uh, not so much on a daily basis anymore. Um, but, um, you know, whenever I come across something that I want to plant, I'll bring it over to a friend's house and say, Hey, you know, can I put this in the ground here? 
I promise you'll get some fruit. Um, so that's, that's kind of my gardening style and my inspiration for photographing those things. And, you know, there's also something special about being able to like pick up the dirt and see the detail of the dirt and like what. Oh yeah. There there's about. a lot going on in there. Right. There's yeah. so much going in there. I'm um, going yeah. on very much alive, just like everything around us. So definitely. I definitely see that connection. Yeah. And I know one of the things I really, really wanted to talk about today is your most recent project that you did with Tucka, Seville, and Zach. Yeah. Documenting bee grafting. And I actually had no idea what bee grafting was. And I did a bit of research, saw a couple of videos, and it's very, very interesting. <laughs> it's, it's wild for sure. Yeah. And Tucka and Zach are both commercial beekeepers and queen producers in Florida. So what exactly is bee grafting and how did you come across this project? Um, well, I, I met Tucka at a like small community gardening event down here and I, I was sitting next to Tucka. She just pulls out um, these queen cells. She was just carrying them around her bag. She just had you know, like five or six queen bees in her bag. Um, and so I, I was pretty curious. Uh, and I, so I just finally got to a point where there was a workshop and I was able to come photograph it. Uh, and so people came from really all over the country to study with Tucka and Zach um, and learn this grafting technique. Uh, so I'm, I'm not extremely technical with bees, but I can give a rough explanation of what went on. Um, so uh, apparently some hives, uh, can be queenless and in order to add a queen, you need to somehow come across one. And so the grafting is, uh, is a way to create a queen that wasn't there previously. So they take the, uh, apparently there's different, the bees make different cells inside the honeycomb and some of them are different shaped. I don't know how exactly they tell the difference, but um, they take the larva from the cell where the bee was supposed to be a worker bee. And I guess the larva at that state can turn into anything. Um, so they carefully remove it from that worker cell and they place it into a queen cell, which is, um, it's like an artificial thing that we've created that tricks the bees into thinking it's a queen. Um, and so they'll place, uh, you know, six or seven queen cells into a queenless hive. And as those queens hatch, they catch them and they move them around to other queenless hives. Uh, and somehow that's better. You can make hives and split them around and make more honey, I suppose, is, is the point of it. Um, but uh, that was my first time seeing something like that, um, I'm, I'm blown away at the delicacy and, and the study that you have to undergo to be able to do this successfully, um, the practice that goes into it. Uh, and the bees don't seem to mind. That's the other really interesting thing is maybe some bees are more behaved than others, but for you know the two day workshop, I wasn't wearing a bee suit. Some people were wearing hoods. They just preferred never to get stung on the face. I, I guess I was lucky. I didn't get stung at all. Um, it, it was absolutely incredible being there um, and kind of photographing, documenting Tucka and Zach's instruction and the people who were attending the class, seeing them learn and uh, have these, you know, they transfer the larva and get so excited that they did it without crushing the larva. Um, so it was really cool to see the progress for everyone. That's very interesting because it is really such a meticulous process. Yeah, definitely. And um, in these videos that I was watching and really depending on the type of environment that the people are doing the grafting and you have to be so careful too mm -hmm. that the larva doesn't desiccate. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. They have to keep them damp. Uh, so when they, when they pull 
uh, honeycomb from uh, from a hive and they're going to harvest the, the larva from it, they have to keep it in a damp towel while, you know, while they're waiting to work. And then in the middle of working, they'll kind of put the towel back over to keep everything damp. Um, but yeah, it, the, the hive itself has, uh, you know, a, a consistent level of humidity. It has a consistent temperature. Um, the bees control that temperature inside the hive through flapping their wings. Um, and yeah, it, it, there, there is, you know, we, we have this term called hive mind where people are working together towards some goal. And that's exactly what's happening in a beehive is all these organisms are working together to keep this one thing alive, which is the larger hive. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's just so interesting because it's tiny. It's a little larger. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, depending on your environment, you want to make sure it doesn't desiccate or dry up, especially with like extreme heat and yeah. doing it outside or if you're doing it under a lamp, depending on really the environment that they're doing it in. Um, and, and having to just transport this tiny larva with a graft stick that they use yeah. to kind of move it from the cell to the manufactured queen bee cell. It's very interesting and I feel like you kind of have to have a lot of patience doing it because it's so yeah. small and there's also so many that you can transfer as well in the hive and I, I was in, it was very interesting for me to see like what that process was like and, and yeah. even seeing it through your photographs as well yeah I you know that goes back to you know how I how I'm working and how I'm observing these things that are happening. And I, I do think a lot about, you know, in shooting and in the edit, you know, am I covering all the steps here? Am I illustrating it to some degree where people could look at the images and say, and maybe have some idea of what's going on. Um, but bee grafting, I, I think, I think some bit of explanation or some background or some knowledge of bees is helpful in kind of understanding what's happening because um, you don't get to see it it's the, the apparently the larva is 24 hours old when they take it out of the cell and then in another 24 hours um there will be uh, it will have grown and start resembling um a queen bee in shape and form um, but it's still like in a larval state and still has this white milky outside to it but you can't i mean all that is happening inside the hive it's hard to you know in a two day two day workshop kind of cover all that right and it's also happening under a microscope as well it is yeah. yeah and you know in an interview that Tucka had with beekeeping today podcast she mentions that queen bees are often easy to find because of how the colony interacts with each other and that a swarm of bees can be about even 12 pounds which yeah. is hundreds or even thousands of bees and i know that you photographed these multiple times. One of your projects that I had seen from you was from public hives. And mm -hmm. as a photographer, being in such an intimate setting where you come up so close to the bees and even the people who are interacting with the bees. And is there any sort of preparation that you have to have beforehand? And I know you mentioned that you didn't wear any gear, but yeah. in a typical setting, would you feel like you're prepared or or, you know, what was that like for you going in there? Um, well, public hives, working with them, that was the first time that I was face-to-face uh, -face with a hive. Um, and I had a suit with a full hood at, at that point and really had no idea what I was getting into. Um, it, it's kind of like donning a scuba suit and going underwater when you wear that full setup. Right. Um, so... <laughs> that 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 first time was tough um i definitely was surprised at how difficult it would be to shoot with the hood but also so distracted by how incredible the hive was um you know being being the first time uh seeing them that close um so i, I was better prepared uh working with tucka and zach um but also just paying attention to tucka and watching her walk through this field of beehives um barefoot uh, that kind of put me at ease and I, I thought, okay, you know, I can, I, I can do this. I can kind of, if someone else is walking through there, I can do it too. 
Um, and then watching her work with the bees, um, just slowly getting closer and closer and becoming more comfortable. Um, definitely some mental preparedness for that. Um, I've, I've, I've watched people on YouTube work with bees without suits and they speak about uh, moving slowly, walking softly, uh, checking in with yourself so you're not, you know, unnecessarily panicking for whatever reason. Um, so it's it's somewhat of a Zen activity. I feel like I'm pretty prepared for more things to be used in the future with this experience. Would you wear the whole outfit again, or do you think you would just kind of? Walk? Yeah, I, I would. It definitely um, it has a a time and place and a use. Um, these hives, they're all pretty used to humans coming and lifting the lid off and peeking around. They, there is some smoke that they use to prevent, I think as far as I understand it, it prevents the bees from swarming and attacking. Um, so you might get stung by one bee that, you know, thinks you're a threat, but it won't be able to communicate with the rest of, uh, with the, rest of the hive to, to initiate some attack. Um, which that's a comforting thought. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, the suit is useful um, with bee removal where you're really angering the hive. Um, or I think there's different species of bee that maybe are more aggressive. Um, and I, I, when you get stung, um, I'm sure a sense of panic sets in, which can then maybe set off more bees stinging you. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm just gonna do whatever you know, whoever's working with the bees, if they're wearing a suit, I'm wearing a suit. That, that makes sense to me. Right. Um, and another thing too, I feel like with that it kind of experience, I know this might sound a little bit crazy, but it's sort of meditative. You have to be- Oh, it's definitely meditative, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you have to be patient because like you said, one little movement can trigger a bee to sting you, then yeah. a bunch of bees. So, it's also great that you are very mindful of your environment and even the people that are working in the environment as well. Like if they're wearing protective gear and they're wearing this suit, you're going to wear it as well because that's yeah. like going to alert you, okay, this might be a more angrier, angrier swarm of bees or they Definitely. might not use the human. So it's, you know, it's great that you're taking those level of precautions. And I even encourage other photographers who maybe haven't done it the first time or looking to photograph bees or even other animals to have protective gear as well. Yeah. And you can, you can get a suit pretty cheap online. So always cool to have in the kit, you know? Right. <laughs> Just for backup even. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, right now we are coming up to our very last question. And it's what advice would you give a photographer that is starting out that maybe is trying to figure out like what their specific style is? What kind of advice mm. would you give them so that they could figure out how to brand themselves? Um, I mean, just, I, I think from my personal experience, um, I, I definitely felt like I had more of a direction or um, a purpose, uh, when I really embraced those things I was passionate about. And, um, that didn't come until after I graduated SCAD, I, you know, in SCAD, I didn't really, I didn't really work with plants. I wasn't gardening. Um, I, I knew I was passionate about photography, but I think photography on its own, um, I don't know, it feels a bit like a tool that's not being used for something. Um, if you're just kind of uh, I guess, obsessed with the process, which is totally fine, which is not my cup of tea. Um, so for me, it's, it's um, an exploratory tool uh, to look at things that I'm fascinated by or curious about. Um, and and I, I think that maybe is the best piece of advice I can give is um, fully embrace what you're passionate about um, as a subject and document the heck out of it. Um, show everyone how passionate you are about it and it comes through in the work i think absolutely that was excellent advice and james i know that you mentioned that you have a couple of new projects coming up this is really your chance to market yourself and give everyone a heads up of what they could be seeing from you in the near future um for sure um i recently shot a story for edible south florida 
that'll be on the cover of I think April. I think it comes out in April, Ooh. the next issue. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's it's about fungus, so cool. that's a little that's enough of a teaser, I think. Um, and I will be photographing in Maine this summer, visiting some of the islands that are off the coast of Maine. Um, I have a trip scheduled on a lobster boat. Um, still looking for some good seaweed harvesting stories um, and some local gardening stories up that way. Um, and then in August, September, I'll be back on the West Coast photographing for a client uh, that has a hemp farm in Oregon. Um, and then we'll be driving south through the redwoods uh, and uh, capturing all the beauty of those trees in that landscape. Looks like there's a lot of travel in your future. I'm so yeah. jealous. <laughs> yeah, road trip. Right, road trip. That's so exciting. I cannot yeah. wait to see the rest of the work that you're going to be creating throughout the Thanks. year. Of course. And one more thing too. I want you to give us a shout out for any photographer that inspires you. Oh, um, let's see. Uh, okay, so... Sam Uchillis is an interesting, interesting photographer. Um, love the video work that he makes. Um, and then Dave Greer, good West Coast photographer, photographing the landscape. Um, there's more. I could keep. I could keep going. I'll keep it. I'll keep it short. Just keep it on those two. <laughs> That's perfect. I'll also post links in the video as well. Cool. All right. Thank you so much for everyone who just watched this video. And thank you to James for being with us today. Please see more of his work at jamesjackman.com.